Okay. Well, my name is the Reverend Susan Sowers, and I'm the rector here at St. Christopher's Episcopal Church. And it is really, really my honor to uh, welcome all of you here. Um, I'm tickled, tickle pink, that this, you know, on a day with such weather, on a week with such weather, um, that so many were able to come. And it definitely shows that there is... There is a concern and there is a care um, on, on this issue of refugees. You know, I served for a lot of years in the military first. I was in the Army. And um, one of the, the first things we'd like to do is define the problem before we figure out what we're going to do about the problem. And, and as Christians even, um, we, we like to take the time to understand a problem so that it can digest in us and we see if the, if the spirit is working to say we should do something to help. Um, you know, refugees is, is a problem at, as big as it's been since World War II. Um, at least 65 million um, folks without homes. And just um, from the Christian perspective of caring about people who have needs, um, of fulfilling our baptismal covenant, um, our prayers, if nothing else, our cares and our prayers are really important. And um, I think just understanding the problem helps inform our prayers. And perhaps when we pray, you know, give us this day our daily bread. Give us the things that we need to sustain us. That we think of, of a larger pool. Like who else needs um, their daily bread? Who else needs a home? Um, you know, and plus it's, a, you know, really it's an American value that we, not only a Christian value, but an American value, that we invite people that don't have homes to a place that has a promise of hope and, um, and a promise of a life. So I was thrilled when Rachel Hardy came to me and said, you know, so this is weighing on my heart. This, this is a big problem. And, and Rachel really doesn't have a, a dog in that hunt. I mean... She doesn't have relatives that are refugees um, and all the rest, but she knew that God was, was tapping on her shoulder. And so she came and she said, what can we do? And um, she got herself a committee together and they decided, well, let's, let's have a dinner and let's just define the problem and, and bring in speakers that know what they're talking about. So before I give um, Rachel a chance to, to talk for a minute, I did want to just show you a, a two-minute clip by... Um, our presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, uh, Michael Curry, and yesterday was was um, international. Thank you, Refuge Day, World Refuge Day, and um, he has asked that Episcopalians get informed and see what you what you can do. Um, he introduced what I thought was really neat: this this poster from the 1930s. And this is um, from the 1930s, right after, as we were plunging into, you know, from World War I to World War II, there was all this problem of displaced people. And so how can the Episcopal Church help resettle? And so for a long time, this has been in our, in our DNA and it's felt like a mission. And so um, Michael Curry's up next, and then Rachel. Um, Late 1930s, as the world was on the verge of being plunged into an apocalyptic Second World War, Episcopalians, the Episcopal Church, gathered together and began work to resettle those who were refugees fleeing terror in Europe, helping them to resettle families, helping to resettle young people, helping to resettle people in this country in safety and security. Since those 1930s, Episcopalians have been involved in the work of resettling families and people who are refugees, some 80,000. At that time in the 1930s, there was a poster. That poster depicted Mary, the baby Jesus, and Joseph. Mary was on the donkey. They were clearly on a journey. They were fleeing Palestine. They were seeking to find safety in Egypt. They were refugees. The poster from the 1930s read, in the name of these refugees, aid all refugees. In the name of Mary, Joseph, and the Lord Jesus, aid all refugees. 
today. For most of the refugees, like the Holy Family themselves, are families, and most are children. So I invite you to observe June the 20th as World Refugee Day, to learn more about the crisis, and to find ways that you can both pray and help in other ways. God bless you. God keep you. And you keep the faith.
Reverend Fred Hiltz, the Archbishop and Primate of the Anglican Church of Canada. Gracious and generous God, almighty and ever merciful, we turn to you with our care and concern for our world. So many of your children are worrying about the future of this fragile earth our common home. So many children are suffering through the trauma of war. So many are refugees, some living in camps for so many years, so many others on the run, all clinging to the hope of welcome in a new land. So many are malnourished, some starving to death. So many are victims of trafficking for laborers exploiting their dignity as human beings. So many are so neglected that they know not the health and happiness you will for their lives. Teach those who have so much to have a heart for the poor and to be diligent in building societies where there is enough for all. Help us to walk more humbly with you. Make us to be servants of your kindness and justice. Grant us grace to order our lives and our work in the gospel of your dear Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Well, now we're going to have Catholic Charities start their presentation. And Matthew Mee is going to speak first. He's the Executive Director of Catholic Charities in Northwest Florida. And um, he's been so accessible and just helpful and just kind. And so, I've, and Maria too, you're going to hear from all of them, and Josefina. And so I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to him as he gives you a brief overview of all of their services. I like to walk around, so I'm walking and talk. So. Um, I, I'd like to thank Susan for inviting us to your church. It's a, a beautiful congregation. I appreciate everybody coming out. And I'd very much like to thank Rachel. Uh, Rachel called us uh, uh, two months ago, three months ago, and, and just, just the sheer excitement in her voice and the, the care that she had uh, for the refugee situation really got us excited about coming out here. And uh, we had the privilege, privilege of meeting her uh, last week for the first time. And, she was everything that she sounded like talking about. So thank you, Rachel, for coming out. Uh, so I am Matthew Neum, uh, the Executive Director for Catholic Charities in Northwest Florida. Uh, I've been with Catholic Charities for three years now and uh, with the Diocese of Pensacola, Tallahassee for going on 16, 17 years now. So I also like to discredit myself. Um, I, uh, I am not a social worker. I am not a counselor. Uh, but I am somebody that very much believes in the good works of Catholic Charities and uh, the good works of our community. So uh, we are Catholic Charities in Northwest Florida, so we stretch the Florida Panhandle, 18 counties. We have offices in Pensacola, 
Fort Walton Beach, Panama City, and Tallahassee. So people always ask me, you know, where's your office at? And I always say, sitting out in the parking lot because we're always on the road traffic. <laughs> um, you know, what the Catholic Charities is kind of best known for is our emergency assistance program. Uh, under the, I like to look at emergency assistance as kind of a, an um, um, umbrella. Of course, we help with financial assistance. So this year we're, we're slated to put back just a little under, uh, you know, three-fourths of a million dollars back into the community throughout Northwest Florida. But also under that umbrella is our uh, is our food pantries. Uh, we alleviate hunger for over 50,000 people over the, uh, the course of a year throughout the Panhandle. Uh, we have a very nice uh, transitional shelter in Panama City. That's a six-month transitional shelter. It's not only a shelter where people can have refuge and, and, and a safe place to, to sleep, but it also goes through everything, job, job training, job readiness, counseling. Uh, so we very much look at our services as wraparound services when people come to see us. Um, we, uh, we, have a, uh, uh, we are a licensed child placing agency through the Department of Children and Families. So we do conduct home studies, foster care, and child placements. One of the most rewarding things that we do, Catholic Charity has been doing adoptions in this area since 1952. One of the most rewarding things that we do get to do are non-identifying searches. So we have people reaching out to us probably once or twice a week, either looking for a child that they placed with Catholic Charities years ago, or a son or a daughter that's looking for their parents. And we have some wonderful stories. Uh, and it's, it's very, very moving uh, when those families are able to reunite. Uh, we are a, uh, we do a, self-sufficiency program called Caring for Our Communities, which is a six-month uh, program. It's a very intensive program where people come in and we set them up with man mentors or allies, people that have been there and done that, whether they're looking for to better themselves with education, with health, with job readiness. Uh, they meet once a week, actually right up the road here uh, at the cathedral, and uh, it's always over kind of like this, uh, a family meal, and uh, if they come in and talk, usually we have a couple guest speakers that come in, whether it's dealing with education or health or, or whatever they're, they're looking. We very much like to cater to that individual or that client. Uh, Catholic Charities, our, our, our vision, you know, I can't speak highly enough about our staff. Our staff comes to work every day. In the Pensacola office, and on, the, on an average month, we receive between 15 and 20,000 phone calls of people reaching out for help. So every, every day, caseworkers come in and they hear other people's problems. They have to treat them with dignity and respect. I shouldn't say they have to, they do. Um, you know, a lot of these caseworkers, they go home, nobody's working for Catholic Charities trying to get rich. A lot of times they're going through their own financial struggles. They're going, they're taking care of a sick loved one. So for them to come in every day and show the dignity and respect that they do is, is very admirable of them. Uh, our, our, our mission statement is it's a pretty standard mission statement, but what I think is most important about Catholic Charities is our vision statement. It is to, uh, to show, make God's love visible, to always serve because of how we serve. So not everybody that walks through our doors is somebody that we're able to assist. We try to assist everybody, but whether the funding's not there, they don't meet certain requirements, or, or we just don't have the space to see them that week, we always try to treat them with dignity and, and act like, and, and care about them. And I think that's very important to the clients that we serve. Um, our immigration and refugee program is absolutely amazing. Uh, we have one of the best uh, program directors, Josefina DeVito. She's going to come up here and speak. She's laughing, but she is uh, one of the hardest working people at Catholic Charities and a wealth of knowledge for, for Catholic Charities and the people that we serve. So, again, I'd very much like to thank Susan and Rachel for inviting us here, and I'd like to turn it over to Josefina.
by the Board of Immigration Appeal to represent clients before citizenship and immigration services. Um, these two programs are very different one from the other, but both are uh, serving all kind of people in the sense of um, needs for immigration or when they are coming to resettle, how, how, what is the case of the refugees. In the immigration, we have to be accredited in order to legally represent clients for the immigration benefits that they need, like somebody who just came and needs to establish, not a just came, but is petition for someone who qualifies to petition that relative we do the process for or help them, guide them through the process to residence, to naturalization, to asylum if needed, DACA for the people who just um, some time ago qualified because they enter very young with no fault in their own and they don't know many of them other country but the US and they have been allowed to apply, to have employment, and to support themselves and continue their education. In um, the immigration program, we have uh, served in this fiscal year 257 people in Pensacola and 165 in Tallahassee. Application has been 907 for the Pensacola area in Panama City, we have done 306. And for the refugee program, we have resettled in this area three families. One with three, three members in the family from Afghanistan. There are another two men who are brothers, and they came also from Afghanistan, and one single case from Cuba. In Panama City, we have resettled another family who came from Burma, they are four, and there is another family from Syria. Uh, we have to understand that the refugee program has many uh, rules and restrictions before they came in, and Maria is going to give you a very clear uh, idea of what is the process and what we do once they came or they are allowed to arrive to the U.S. Uh, Maria has been uh, responsible for the most part in the refugee program. She does also immigration, but uh, she has been taking care of the refugee part since March of 2010. Uh, with you, I leave Maria, who has plenty to tell you. <laughs>
persecution does not discriminate. A refugee can be a 16-year-old person, can be a 13-year-old person, child. It can be educated and educated. It can happen to anybody. Anybody. Next, please. Refugees are not immigrants. They flee their countries of origin because they fear for their lives. They are in danger. They have oppression that they have lived. These images are true. This is not an exaggeration of the meaning. This is really what happens abroad. So, once they go to a neighboring country usually, or a host country, they uh, get interviewed by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. That agency is the one that determines if a person qualifies under the category of a refugee because of the five grounds and a well-founded fear of persecution. Yes, there's countries where there's a lot of crime, but crimes do not qualify a person to be a refugee. So, those that do qualify, they are um, categorized and registered as refugees, and they say they are either allowed to stay in that country, and in very few occasions they are still in their home country. There's a few uh, exceptions there, but usually they are in a host country. And they are allowed to live there, usually in uh, ref uh, refugee camps, in very hard conditions. They have overcrowding, uh, poor health, poor food. Uh, a lot of rape, uh, they, they get their belongings stolen, they have very little and still the very little things that they have, they also get stolen. Children, women, men, anybody. Alright, so um, ideally once a person flees their uh, country of origin, the ideal situation is that that uh, reason why they left their country of origin changes and they can go back to their home country. Imagine yourselves, if you were the ones that had to flee the U.S., wouldn't you want to come back to what you know, what your culture, what your food, where you feel safe? Or would you rather stay somewhere else where you don't know the culture, you don't know the language? It's, they face a lot. I mean, those, those, those videos that we saw, I mean, as, as heartbreaking as they are, it is true. We need to understand and we need to put it in our hearts and realize how lucky and how blessed we are. All right, so um, the United States is one of the resettling countries after you know, all the um, efforts to uh, give them a durable solution or, or, or trying to uh, make them come, allow them to go back to their home countries. Or if the situation in the host country that they're in are too horrible. So the United States is the main country of a resettlement in the world, They're, um, the host countries right now in this moment, um, because of the uh, refugee crisis that the world is looking mainly in Syria, the host countries are those countries that are around the areas of concern, and they are also developing countries. So can you imagine the situation of what they have plus what the refugees are bringing? So the host countries are Turkey, Pakistan, Lebanon, the Islamic Republic of Iran, Uganda, Ethiopia, Jordan, of course, and, um, okay, so going back, sorry, the resettling countries. Alright, so the U.S., Canada, Australia, Norway, the U.K., New Zealand and Sweden. Those are the
than they were settled in countries. So after the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees has determined that a particular family does qualify as a refugee, and they express that they want to come to the United States, they have an interview with the Department of State and with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Because not everybody that qualifies as a, not everybody that is a refugee qualifies or is admissible to the United States. So an applicant can be found inadmissible to the United States for many reasons. And these include criminal, health, or security grounds. Refugees do go through a whole bunch of screens. This fear that is going around is not true. Of course, there's going to be some bad people that are going to come through anyways. And that's going to happen everywhere that you look at. But they do go through very extensive screenings. They get fingerprinted. They get their eye, they get the retinal screen. How personal or how how in depth is that? DNA sampling, background checks with at least eight institutions. This process can take as little, as little as 18 months, and I will explain which uh, situations this is, but usually it does take a lot more. All right, so after a uh, uh, they have been determined that they are admissible to the United States and at the same time, each year the president, in consultation with um, Congress and some federal agencies, determines how many refugees are going to allow to come to the United States through the resettlement uh, program. Alright, so, the Department of State works very closely with the, what we call, voluntary agencies, or VOLACs. VOLACs, there's nine VOLACs in the United States. These are, this is the list. The this Church World, World Service, Ethiopian Community Development Council, Episcopal Migration Ministries, Immigrant Aid Society, International Rescue Committee, U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants, Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services, it is also known as uh, LIRS, U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, that's the agency that we get, the, that's the ball at, that we get our refugees through, and World Relief Corporation. Next one, please. So, um, every week in Washington, the Department of State gets together with those nine bullets. And they look at the poll, all the people that have already gone through all the background screenings <coughs> they need and are ready to um, come to the United States, the ones that have expressed or that, that they want to come to the United States. So they have a list of all of them. And in that list, they have information about the case composition, the language that they speak, the uh, religion, the special needs that each one has. And all those uh, nine uh, VOLACs, they say, okay, I, I will take this one, I will take that one, give me that one. The medical cases are the ones that none of those VOLACs want, the very severe cases. USCCB resettles 30% of those cases. We get the majority of um, next one, please. All right, so there is two ways that a case can be placed here in the U.S. There are those free cases, and there's the U.S. type cases. A U.S. type case is a case that has a friend or a family member present in the U.S., and that they have expressed that they are willing to uh, help with the resettlement of that particular case. Catholic Charities of Northwest Florida only works with U.S. type cases. 
The other ones that are called free cases are those cases that do not have a particular person that they know or a family member, but the agencies have bigger programs where they provide all the services needed. So they are placed among them. <coughs> Refugees are survivors. They uh, are the biggest uh, I mean, fighters. They are so strong. We are so blessed because we see the good part of them. <laughs> when they come to us, those struggles that they have left are behind, and they become their strength. So that is an amazing thing. We learn, I have learned so much from the different cultures. It is just an amazing opportunity. It is just breathtaking. And, and one thing was, um, we were working with a family from Myanmar, from Burma. And they had little kids, and when they come here, they realized that mom also has to work. And we had a, a, a contract with the Department of Children and Families at that time, and we were able to pay for childcare for the children so that the mom could go to work. Well, we come to find out that Burmese will not place the child for uh, caregiving if it's not a family member. So, we tried, and you know, it's, it's really amazing, but then at the same time, how do you tell them you have to? You have to let them know, it's like, okay, we understand that this is how it went before, but this is their reality. Because there is limited help available in the community, but you do need to go and work. And when she realized what she could learn from going to work, it was just so amazing. She had two little kids. They did not have a car. She learned how to use the bus, would drop the, the, the smallest child at daycare, then would drop the other one with a friend, and then she would go to English class and then to work. So it was really amazing. All right, so um, our program, is called reception and placement. Mainly what we do is that we, well, the program lasts for uh, up to three months. So our, uh, our um, goal is to make sure that they have all their um, basic needs met. We pick them up at the airport. We take them to a home. It's usually the U.S. Thai home because of the cases that we uh, place. Although we have had some cases where the U.S. Thai has expressed that they have very limited uh, capacity of helping with the family. They cannot house them because they don't have a house big enough to house the entire family. So we have stepped up and we have been able to find housing for them and uh, the community has been amazing. We have worked with different um, actors in the, in, the, in the area. There is this family that we resettled in the Mary Esther uh, area, and um, the, what's the name? The agency that helped us? Huh? The Salvation Army. The Salvation Army helped us with uh, a lot of the furnishings that we need because there is a, there is a list that gives us required elements. So it's 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 very basic. The, if if it's um if it's a child they want to make sure that they're gonna have a car seat because in the US and that's also part of the cultural orientation that we have to say a child has to be in a car seat. So we make sure that they have that, we make sure that they have bottles, that they have formula, diapers, everything. And we, uh, one of the requirements is that we have um, culturally appropriate ready to eat meal. Was the, what does that mean? Well, we have people from different nationalities, different religions. So I'm not going to make our delicious barbecue pork for a Muslim family. <laughs>
as possible. Of course, the three months maximum can be a challenge, especially when you have clients that do not speak English. That's a Clients that do not have transportation. We all know the transportation system in Northwest Florida is not the best. It does exist, but I think that the, the last bus that runs is like 5.30. So if you have a job that goes up until 9 o'clock, like, uh, what do we do? So then we get the community to step in and donate bicycles <laughs> or help us with transporting them. So, <clears throat> next one, please. So, what we do with each um, case is that each um, employable refugee gets an assessment of their strengths, their weaknesses, and we do a resettlement plan with them. Of course, most of them are going to be uh, sent to English classes. We partner with Pensacola State College. They have an amazing program, and um, we also teach them employability skills. We teach them how to dress for an interview. We teach them how to write a resume. Believe it or not, in other countries of the world, first thing you have to put is a picture. <laughs> and you say you're married, and that is for them to say, you don't do that here. Say, no. <laughs> and that is something that uh, we enjoy a lot doing because we learn a lot from each other. And sometimes they say, well, I don't know how to do anything. I was like, yes, you do. Do you know how to cook? Yeah. That's something. Do you help your children with school? Yes. That's something. Maybe we can look at something as a teacher aid in the future or something. Do you sing? Do you play an instrument? Anything that you do can be used. Maybe not immediately for job-related purposes, but you can start uh, making connections in your community, and then that could lead to you know, the ideal job that you have. For those uh, clients that we have that are uh, very educated, like doctors and um, uh, lawyers, of course, the process is going to be a lot different, but still, the resume is the one that never fails. Picture is always there. <laughs> Next one, please. Okay, so um, refugees have, uh, they receive public benefits, and of course, we help them to enroll in those public benefits, or the benefits of the public benefits. Um, it's for up to eight months after they arrive, and I say up to because many of them become employed and they will not receive them for that amount of time. Like in everything, there's people that are going to um, adjust a lot quicker than others. And so some are going to use the eight months, <laughs> others are not. After they arrive in the country, they also have to get an additional uh, medical exam we partner very closely with the Escambia County Department of Health. They get immunizations, they get um, health screening. And if the family has children, we help them to enroll in school. We take them to the ESOL program at the Escambia County School District first. And the, the, the staff over there is just amazing. They give them a placement test. I don't know how they do it because they do not speak a word of English, but they can still know where to place them, where to place them. especially because, you know, with um, clients that, for example, the ones that have come from Syria, they have not been attending school for a while. So that is going to create a delay and additionally, of course, the language. And not every school in Pensacola or in the area is uh, ESO, which is uh, English for Speakers of Other Languages. So we have to make sure that they get sent there so that they can receive the, the most help to begin with. Next one, please. So, and I, I love this picture. This is my favorite picture, and it represents the refugee program so well. Uh, here in the U.S., refugees find fulfillment of their hopes and dreams. 
hopes of a new life, dreams of freedoms never uh, before experienced, believe that their children will have a better future, and biblically, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Next one, please. Famous refugees. Not all of them came to the United States. <laughs> Albert Einstein, he was born in Germany. He fled Germany in 1932. He got a teaching position at Princeton University. Then we have very famous Henry Kissinger. I was trying to see. In, in, I'm from Colombia in South America, and we would pronounce it Kissinger and Deb Coomer, who's one of our volunteers at Catholic. How do you pronounce this? <laughs> um, he was uh, Secretary of State for President Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford, and he's most known uh, for being an American top diplomat who negotiated the end of the Vietnam War, which was an amazing thing. We have actor Andy Garcia from Cuba. We have Madeleine Albright who fled, um, at that time the name was Czechoslovakia, now is the Czech Republic, and her family left in 1948 when the communists took over. Next one, please. Yeah, we have a whole bunch here. Mm -hmm. Dalai Lama, who is the spiritual leader of the Tibetan people, he left uh, China after the Chinese Civil War. He went to the northern part of India, and has lived in the exile for the last 50 years. <coughs> we have French author Victor Hugo, author of Le Miserable and The Hunchback of Notre Dame. He was also involved in politics. He fought a lot against poverty, about, uh, against injustice. He was exiled and he fled Jersey? No, but he went somewhere else first. Brussels. Brussels. <laughs> All right, we have this beautiful actress, Mila, Mila, Mila Kunis. She was known, she's known for her role in the movie The Black Swan. Her family uh, left fleeing religious persecution in the Soviet Union.
gentleman named Lopez Lamont. I don't know who, anybody know, know him? No? Let's just, let's, let's just look at the video because he was just amazing, amazing, amazing. And this is where, again, what I was saying in the beginning, their struggles become their strength. This is a gentleman who fled Sudan. He was literally taken away from his mother from church when he was six years old. And he was taken to a camp. And one night, him and the other kids that are known as the Lost Boys of Sudan, they ran for days, as fast and as far away as they could. And then he lived in a refugee camp in Kenya for 10 years until he was resettled in the U.S. where he became an Olympic uh, athlete and he won several races and he's still competing. I was born in Tazadan. We have simple life, but we are very happy. Until I was six years old, when my life completely changed. The place that we know that was peaceful turned out to be chaos. So this was fully kids away from their houses. I remember my mom was still holding me very, very tight. This big soldier moved me from my mom. And likely, as I was like crying, TV. 
na aula. I can put that same jewels in my chest and inspire other kids. If you bring me, you get there one day. trying to discern how, what to do, if we could do something, is are there ways that we could assist your, your agency? Absolutely. Thank you. When we um, get the note, the, the notification that a family is coming, we have to find all furnishings. Like I said, there's a, there's a minimum amount of things that we need to gather. There's a list that we have over there in the back. Right now, we just know that there is a family that is coming that has two children. I believe one is four and the other one is seven. But once they get here is when we will know the sizes of the clothes and stuff because it's really hard to know from the, the page that we get with their information. But absolutely. And uh, as as much uh, donation, as, as much as the donations help, I think that what helps these people the most is if we show them that we care, that they are welcome. If you take them to places, if you show them, it's like, look, there's this really nice coffee shop, let me take you there. Um, go with your children, go to the beach, do, do, do different things with them, spend quality time with them. That would be an amazing way of helping. Okay, but we can. <laughs> One thing that we have to also let you know is that when we take care of refugees, there are um, some restrictions to assist them directly. Um, the person who assists the volunteer that is screened or help them has to be screened because of uh, the rules or restrictions that we. 
Uh, but other than that, they require of a lot of services and also several items to um, set their, their homes to start their lives here. Put a yellow pad out here when y'all leave in front of the little brown box where I want you to put your feedback card. But if you put your email address on there, we'll get that list to them, and then they can put you in the email blast whenever a new refugee family comes in and they have any you know material needs, and then you can provide. So that's one easy way. You know, if you see something, it can be gently used, right? Oh yes. And so that's a way that you can help. I didn't put you know if y'all knew that I put the list. One way we can individually help is to join volunteer organizations like this one. One way we can individually help is to join organizations such as Learn to Read and our Jim Williams here, he's on the staff. And it's so important to meet these folks and then we understand better the plight of refugees and I've, I've benefited much more than they benefit as far as, as my work in Learn to Read. Absolutely. Yes. If there's 65 million, if there's 65 million refugees or whatever this says around the world, yes. and we're settling a family here and a family there, what what do you need to be able to do more? What can we do to help you be able to do more? That would be a long process that would start with negotiations with the Department of State. Mm -hmm. But the main thing that we would have to show or prove is that we have the capacity. And like transportation, housing, all these things play a very important role in this. It's a lot of the uh, northern states, Minnesota, Michigan, they have very large uh, resettlement of, of areas there, but they also own very large apartment complexes or communities that they're able to safely house the people. And one thing that Maria did not hit on was that a lot of the refugees that we have here, they come because of our military presence, and they're special immigrants or special refugees, and that's anybody that's assisted our families overseas, and, and now their lives are in danger because of it. So the, the, the families, I, I would say 80 to 85% of the refugees that we get here have that status. And a lot of them that we get were interpreters over there or military police. So that, that's really special for us, even though it's small numbers. It, it still means a lot that even one of the families that we resettled in Mary Esther, her husband was Air Force and deployed. Uh, I think she was in her eight months pregnant <laughs> and, and housed a, a family of four uh, for uh, at least a month until we were able to you know, get them in and stably house. So Northwest Florida is, is fortunate enough to have the military families here that will, will be their time, but unfortunately we just don't have the housing or the transportation here, the affordable housing that enables them. It's one thing that they look at when they're doing the resettlement is where they're, the, the best fit is for, the, for these people. So Minnesota, Michigan, you see a lot of them going uh, up there. So I hope that answers some of your Is it feasible that a church would adopt a family? Is that there's many members here that belong to St. Christopher. Is, is that an avenue? That Absolutely, <laughs> yes. Yes, like I said, spending quality time with them is what they are going to um, take the most advantage out of. And of course, adopting them, yes. <laughs> yeah, the, the family that we have coming in is... Uh, is I'm sorry, I'm biting the cold too, so my voice is a little bit raspy. The family that we have coming in has a U.S. tie here, but they've, they've been one of the families that expressed to us that they don't have the housing conditions to house a family of four. They re are resettling to the Milton area. Uh, so, of course, anybody that has a, a, knows a landlord has a guest house or something like that that's comfortable, you know, letting, holding a house, you know, because we don't get a lot of notice on when they're coming in. And we don't get a set date, so it's very tough for us to convince a landlord uh, that somebody with no credit, somebody with no job, you know, to be able to, you know, if we're here to help only for three months, uh, which of course we 
we're able to help financially for three months, but they're always able to reach out to us. Um, so, you know, if you have some connections in the community, if you have a guest house and you're willing to have somebody, you know, please reach out to us. Uh, we would you know, be happy to walk you through. There's a, a simple screening process that you have to go through. Um, but other than that, yes, there's, there's lots of ways to sponsor or adopt a family. One other question. I'm aware Milton has even less bus transportation than us. So, unfortunately, there we don't have a say so. The thing is that the U.S. tie of this person, that's where they live. Although they have expressed that they have very limited uh, ways of helping with the family, we still want to have them there close to them. But, but if it comes to Pensacola being the only option, we can also do that because we're still with the 100 miles radius that we are allowed to work with. Question, are they able to drive? They are able to drive as soon as they get their employment authorization card. Yes. They so, are. so finding them an automobile would be a good thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And teaching them how to drive because it's very <laughs> different <laughs> in our countries. <laughs> Believe it or not, the line on the street needs decoration. <laughs> <laughs> with Faber House for many years in the shelter and um, became aware of community resources and a lot of times places will garner tickets for families like Pensacola Little Theater um, and you just ask and so there's abilities to pass on to families. Uh, we have a website called Pensacola with Kids and you know of it. They have the magazine Parents that's out, that's free publications. But you can find things on there that are often, most of the time, free for families and that, and a way to pass on things to the families. Yeah. 
Thank you. 